Well, good morning. To those of you watching online, we welcome you also to our service. It's good to be back together. We are in uh, week two of a three-part sermon series called A Thrill of Hope, A Weary World Rejoices. Last week, Pastor Tim focused on the joy that we have in Christ. And, and that's truly a lot of what we celebrate at this time of the year. But uh, this morning, we're going to talk about hope, the hope that we have in Christ and why hope is important. We'll talk about what hope means in the life of the believer. It's been a very um, important sermon for me to study this week. And I think that we'll all be able to relate to it in some way, shape, or form as we dive into it. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your great love for us. I thank you that no matter what we do or where we're at, your love for us never changes. Your love for us is unconditional. I pray, Father, that we would grow in our faith. I pray that we'd grow in our obedience to you. I pray that we would walk closely with you. Even when things don't make sense, I pray that we would cling to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, let's hear it for 2020. It's almost over. I mean, I'm like really looking forward to closing the door on 2020. 2020 has really been a grind. You know, we can look at a couple different factors. I would say um, it's been an election year, right? So anytime there's an election, things get contentious. Everybody gets in their own little camp and uh, we're divided. And there's winners and losers and not everybody's happy. Not everyone's gracious. And then sprinkle in, I don't know if you heard, but there's also a global pandemic going on in 2020. And everyone has different um, thoughts and ideas about that, whether it's real or not, or there's, there's a lot going on. And 2020 is, um, it's been a tough year. And I think that um, it's important that we talk about hope this morning. I, I really like the title to our sermon series, A, Worry, A Weary World Rejoices. I would say that that's pretty accurate. We are in a weary world right now. I know I'm getting tired. Time Magazine, um, earlier this month, declared 2020 like totally the worst year ever. That's how I picture the, this going in their, their meeting as they're declaring 2020 the worst year year ever. And when I read that, I was like, you know, I think like the mid-1860s during the Civil War probably were worse. Or like 1944, 43, 42, when we didn't know who was going to win the World War. I, I'm thinking that's probably worse than where we're at now. So we'll give 2020 third place in the worst year ever competition. What is it that gets us through difficult years like 2020 or 1943? What is it? It's hope. Hope that it's going to be better in 2021. Hope that it's going to be better next year. Have any of you ever seen the movie Unbroken or maybe read the book? Came out 15, 2015, I think. Um, it's about an Olympic athlete. His name was Louis or Louis Zamperini, and he was a runner. He was a miler in the Olympics. And um, I think he ran in 36, and then he was supposed to run in 1940. And a war broke out, so he decided to join the army. He ended up in the Air Corps. And uh, during his time in the service, they were located in the Pacific. 
and they were sent out on a search and rescue mission. Another crew had gone down in the ocean and they were sent out to find them and uh, the plane wasn't in the best condition and they ended up ditching into the ocean. He and his two crewmates that survived, I think there were nine on board, uh, three of them survived. Um, they drifted in the Pacific Ocean for 47 days. Think about that. In terms of hope, think about drifting for 47 days. 47 days ago, it was October 15th. Think about how much has changed, transpired, how many meals you've eaten, how much you've drank since October 15th. That's a long time to go without food and regular water. They faced starvation and extreme thirst. They fought off sharks with nothing but paddles. Their life raft was strafed by a Japanese bomber for 30 minutes. They just kept doing loops, shooting at this life raft, trying to sink it. Eventually they gave up and flew away. And the three guys, they still survived. In an interview, Louis said that there's no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole. He said That's com that sentiment is compounded or multiplied in a life raft. He said they prayed morning, noon, and night, round the clock, that God would rescue them, that they would survive. It didn't get any better when they made landfall on the Marshall Islands. Louis, in that interview, said he weighed 65 pounds. I haven't weighed 65 pounds since like probably first grade, maybe second grade. Can you imagine starting a brutal captivity weighing 65 pounds? Louis was held in captivity by the Japanese for 785 days. People died of despair. I can't even, can't even imagine 47 days in the life raft. So how did he survive when so many did not? Louis said he had an indestructible hope, a hope that he would one day return to his family in Northern California. No matter how bad it got, Louis believed that he would survive. He kept telling himself that he was going to make it. Believing that if anyone could make it, it would be him. If anyone could survive, it would be him. In short, Louis had nothing but hope. But hope is a powerful motivator. The idea that no matter what I'm going through right now, it's going to get better. There are better things in store for me. There's a significant difference between the hope we have as believers and Louis's hope. Louis's hope was based on an idea that I'm going to make it. No guarantees, just an idea that he's going to make it. Our hope is based on the promises of God. We serve a God with a long track record of keeping his promises. This morning's sermon is entitled, Seeds of Hope. We will see that God has sown these seeds of hope throughout his word, like breadcrumbs for us to find. Our hope is based on more than just an idea that things will get better. Our hope is based on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Today we're going to look at three different groups of people and the hope that they had had. The seeds of hope that were sown for them. The first group is the nation of Israel. They're in bondage to Egypt. So if you open up your Bibles to Exodus 6, Exodus 6, 1 through 12, we're going to discover the hope that they had. Exodus 6, verse 1. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, now you will see that I, what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country. Verse two, God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself fully known to them. Verse four, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, where they resided as foreigners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites, whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Verse seven, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen. They did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. I hope that's not you this morning. I hope you're actively listening to God. Verse 10. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of his country. Verse 12. But Moses said to the Lord, if the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak with faltering lips? So as we dive into Exodus 6, we look at that passage and it begins with, then the Lord said, which tells us something's happened before this passage. What precipitated this passage? Well, if we take a quick peek at what happened before this passage, we learn the mindset of the Israelites. It gives us a little background as to where they are in their head, what they've been dealing with for decades. It's important for us to understand their state of mind. So let's look in Exodus 1, verse 8. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. So you're all familiar, hopefully most of you, are familiar with the story of Joseph, right? Joseph was one of the founding brothers or tribes of Israel. And a great famine came throughout the land. God chose Joseph to not only save the fledgling nation of Israel, but also to save Egypt. So God chose, God, chose Egypt, or God chose Joseph to go off to Egypt, prepare the world for a famine, and that's where the nation of Israel really begins to gain steam. Joseph was a hero in Egypt, but as we see in verse 8 of chapter 1, there's a new king now, and he doesn't really care for Joseph or his descendants. He says this in verse 9. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have come, become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. If war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter and harsh. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And in their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. So the nation of Israel for generations has been mistreated on a grand scale. There are generations of Israelites who have not known freedom, just bondage, just 
slavery, misery for generations. But we see things start to change. There's a little glimmer of hope on the horizon. Verses 22 through 23 of chapter 5. Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Moses is advocating for the people. And that's when God starts to remember like he forgot. God didn't forget. But Moses begins to advocate for the people. Why are you allowing this to happen? Why, Lord, why have you brought trouble on these people? Is this why you have sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you have not rescued your people at all. So all throughout the first five chapters of Exodus, God is leaving seeds of hope. He's reminding the children of Israel he's not forgotten them. He's not abandoned them. He's got a plan for them. It's not going to be like this forever. They are his chosen people. He did not create them to be in bondage forever. We serve a God of purpose. He didn't lose track of the Israelites. He has a plan for them. Imagine being the Israelites, slaves, being mistreated with no end in sight. But they have hope. Although they don't see it, they have great reason for hope because God has made promises. He made promises to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. Exodus 6, verse 8. And I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. God says you can take it to the bank. When I make a promise, you can take it to the bank. And Moses is standing up telling his brothers, listen, listen to what God has said. I hope that's you now during 2020. I hope you're standing up and you're listening, offering hope, telling those around you to listen to what God has said. It's going to be wonderful when we have our own land. We need to cast that vision. Moses is casting that vision. He's planting those seeds of hope. It's all going to be a distant memory when we've got our own place. So who do you relate to in that story right now in 2020? Do you relate to Moses or do you relate to the nation of Israel? Are you wore out? Are you beat down? Are you disenchanted with the world around you? Maybe the election didn't go the way you wanted it to. Maybe you're tired of being quarantined. Maybe you're worried about some vaccine mandate that's going to come. Maybe you're worried about getting COVID. Sometimes our circumstances can truly overwhelm us. I'll admit that happens to me. My circumstances can overwhelm me and I, I take my eyes off of Jesus and I focus on the circumstances. Or are you like Moses? Telling people that God has made promises. God keeps his promises. God is not going anywhere. He has not forgotten you. He will deliver us. He does have a plan. We must trust in him. We must hope. God has given us seeds of hope that we must water. The second group that we're going to look at that has seeds of hope is Israel again, but now they're in Rome. They're under Roman occupation, and they are not enjoying it. Extra biblical scholars, history written down apart from what we have in our Bible, 
along with what we have in our Bible, tell us that there were about a dozen Jewish revolts around the time of Jesus. A dozen. It was a vicious cycle. They'd get fed up with the Romans. Somebody would step up and be a leader. He'd gather a small army. They'd have some measure of success overthrowing the occupying force. But then someone like would send a letter off to Rome and Rome would send in legions just to steamroll them. And that happened time after time after time. The people of Israel did not like being under Roman rule. So these leaders of these rebellions, the Romans would kill them. If they didn't kill them in, bat, in battle, they would crucify them. They would execute them. The Jews at that time were looking for, they were looking for deliverance. I'm sure that's all many of them could think about. Deliverance. They want freedom. Why? What are they, what are they looking for? Well, they want freedom from taxes. Two of the major things that, that they did not like and that they fought with the Romans over time and time again were unfair taxes and religious freedom. Can you relate to that? We're worried now about our religious freedom. Taxes are a very real reality for us. The answer that the Jewish rebels came up with was war. We're going to fight. Jesus wasn't the Messiah that they were looking for. Look in Mark 12, chapter, uh, verse 13. We're going to see how the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the time, interacted with Jesus, what they thought about Jesus. We're going to see what their focus on, what they cared about. Verse 13, And they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? Verse 15, but knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought one. And he said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. I think we fall into that temptation sometimes. We get so focused on deliverance that we don't see the deliverer even if he's right there in front of us. We can make deliverance an idol that we worship instead of worshiping the deliverer. The Pharisees were blind. The Messiah was right there in front of them. And they're trying to catch him. They're trying to trick him. They're trying to fool him. Why? Because he wasn't the Messiah that they wanted. So they were going to try and get rid of him. And they thought, well, if we can sucker him into some type of tax war, maybe the Romans will take care of it for us. But Jesus is so wise in his answer. He doesn't bite. He asks for a denarius. And he says, whose likeness and inscription is here? Caesar's, they say. He says, then render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and give unto God what is God's. Here's the question. Whose likeness are you made in? God's likeness. You belong to God. 
is his inscription written on your life? That's an that's important question for us. As we really think about hope and what hope we have, we have to answer that question. Is the inscription of God written on my life? Or am I still just living my own life, doing my own thing? Do you belong to Jesus? Have you given your life to Jesus? If you have, then you've got hope. No matter what you're facing, no matter how hard life is, even if the pandemic goes on for another four or five years, we all pray that doesn't happen. But if your hope, if your faith is in Christ, you have hope. Jesus is telling the Pharisees, don't get caught up in current events, okay? We could make a list of current events. The election, the pandemic, the weather, whatever it is. Jesus is saying, don't get caught up in current events. My kingdom is not flesh and blood. The Pharisees should have known better. They were biblical scholars, there are so many seeds of hope sown in the Old Testament that they should have been without excuse. If you're interested in looking at some of those seeds of hope, I'd encourage you to Google after the service, not right now, pay attention, we're almost there. Google after the service, Jews for Jesus, top 40 messianic prophecies. Look that up afterwards, and you'll see laid out time and time and time again these seeds of hope that God has sown throughout his word to let the Pharisees know, to let you and I know that a Savior is coming. So I'd encourage you to do that after the service. Look that up. I was reading through those earlier this week, and I came across two prophecies I want to bring to your attention one has to do with Christmas and Bethlehem. And it's found in Micah 5.2. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient of days. That's the prophet Micah telling us Jesus is going to be, your Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. The guy you're looking for is going to be born in Bethlehem. The Pharisees should have known where Jesus was from. They should have taken the word of God and investigated for themselves and taken the claims of Jesus and compared them to the word of God. If they would have done so, they would understand that he's not there to overthrow Rome. He's there to save humanity from hell. Another prophecy is Psalm 118, 22 through 24. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Who are the builders? The Pharisees. The Pharisees rejected Jesus. This very story that we just talked about when it came to taxes and Caesar, that is prophecy being fulfilled. And the Pharisees had no idea. They had no idea that before them stood the Messiah the deliverer that they had studied their whole life. Jesus is the cornerstone. The builders are the Pharisees and they are so blind that they don't see their fulfilling prophecy themselves. All the seeds of hope are right there, but no one's watering them. Are you watering the seeds of hope that Christ has laid out for you? The third group we're going to study this morning. You should all be familiar with because it's you, it's me, it's the church here and now. So we've talked about the Israelites under Egyptian bondage, 
under Roman occupation, and now we're talking about you and I, the church here and now. And we will see that there are abundant seeds of hope for you and I. We need deliverance. I'm not talking about lockdowns or coronavirus or politics. Look around. Study culture for like five minutes. I think it's getting darker. I don't think it's getting brighter. I think it's getting darker. Every second that ticks by, the moment our deliverer returns is closer. The question is, will you be ready when he returns? He's leaving the breadcrumbs, the seeds of hope. He's saying, I'm coming back. Will we be ready? As a pastor, occasionally I'm present when someone from our congregation gets called home to heaven. I'll never forget the first time I stood at the foot of someone's deathbed. The person was too young. She should have had more time. And I remember standing there with tears streaming down my face, telling God to fix this. This is not right. In the garden, when we were designed, we were born, when we were created, we were not designed to die like that. I was sad and I was a little upset. A few years later, I stood at my dad's deathbed and I watched him trans transition from death to life. As he made his way, as God took him home. I preached at his funeral. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. I hate funerals. Because when we were created, we were not supposed to die like that. I want God to come back and fix that. I want him to make it right. Then I read 1 Thessalonians 4 this week, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. Verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep. Paul's saying, we don't want you to be uninformed about those who have died. That you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. As believers, we have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command. This is a promise that Jesus is making to us right now. This is a big, fat seed of hope laying in the Bible for us to water. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Jesus is going to fix it. He is coming back. And I don't want us to grieve like those who are uninformed. We have hope. This passage is a, is a gigantic seed of hope. Jesus is coming back. He's going to make it right. I don't know your life story, but if you're human, I'm sure it involves deep hurt and pain. This passage is telling you that Jesus is coming for you. In your hurt, in your pain, in your shame, in your guilt, in your disappointment, Jesus is coming back, and he's coming to make it right. 
Are you ready for that? The older I get, the more ready I am. Come, Lord Jesus, make it right. Don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be so focused on deliverance that that's all you look for. I don't want us to miss the deliverer because we're obsessed with deliverance. He's going to make it right. Here is a promise, one of my favorite funeral passages, one of my favorite promises from the word of God, Revelation 21, verse 1. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. The sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the holy city New Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And as I heard, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Think about that. The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Just like the Garden of Eden. He's fixing it. It's coming full circle. That is our ultimate deliverance. We will be with God and he will be with us. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Amen? He is going to come back. He is going to fix it. He's going to make it right. And though we don't deserve it, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, he's going to put you in a place of honor. Do we deserve it? We do not. But because he loves us, Because he loves us, he will dwell with men and men with him. The presence of God. That's the hope that we have. It is so different than Louis Zamperini's hope that maybe someday I'm going to make it, I'm going to survive. We have promises from God Almighty saying this is what I'm going to do. He has a long track record. God is batting a thousand when it comes to keeping promises but it's easy to forget. I'll admit to forgetting it. I've forgotten it this week. We have to keep our focus on Jesus Christ, on the deliverer. No matter how bad we want deliverance, we have to keep our focus on the deliverer. So are you ready for him to come back? What should we be doing as we get ready? Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. How can I encourage those around me to love and good works? What, what is love and good works? Living a Christ-like life. Serving others, serving him in love. Verse 25, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The day is approaching. He promised he would come back. He's going to come back. Are you ready? I don't think I'm ready. In a sense, I'm ready. It would be nice to be done with all this 2020 business. But am I ready? I think we all have work to do to get ready. So because of that, I have a little bit of homework for you. Remember when I used to give out homework? It was awesome. I want us to memorize those two verses. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Would you pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, I love these people. I thank you for bringing them here this morning. Father, I thank you for gathering us together. We are not worthy of your love. Yet you love us unconditionally. Father, as we get distracted by the difficulties of life, the circumstances that weigh us down, that make it so difficult, I pray that our hope would be firmly rooted in the promises of your word. Father, I pray that they would be unshakable. I pray that you'd use your Holy Spirit in my life to remind me of those promises. We love you. We look forward to your son's return. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.